Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. It's great to see everybody here. And tonight we have a special uh, interview with uh, Dr. Robert Wachter, who is the Chair of Medicine at UCSF, as we say, at University of California, San Francisco, um, and is also an author of many books, one of them being The Digital Doctor. And this is Katie Hafner, a journalist, a co-host and co um, host and co-executive uh, producer of a podcast called Lost Women of Science and the author also of many books, including her novel, The Boys. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things that they do together because these two are married. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, um, part of it is, is, is to try to understand, you know, two people with uh, such uh, productive careers, uh, living together, working together, um, but working in two totally different fields, uh, not totally different fields. One working on the science, one writing about the science. It must have been very, very fascinating. And um, so we'll start with the first question, which is both of you can answer. Is it really possible to edit each other's work? I mean, do you, do you, do you read each other's work? And, and, and uh, does anybody have veto power over the other person? <laughs> <laughs> I actually think it's one of the lovely parts of our relationship that we are able to edit each other's work and stay stay friends. Uh, it friends? Requires, <laughs> it requires, this is news. It requires a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of couples and uh, that are writers who can't do it. I, I remember Atul Gawande, the the, yeah. the surgeon and author who once said to me that he had a discussion with his wife and decided that she would either be his kind of proponent or his editor, but not both. You couldn't be both. <laughs> and I, we get away with it. I think we both respect each other's judgment a lot. And uh, uh, I think that we, uh, Katie's, I, I can tell you, I, I'm, I don't, I, Katie's a much better writer than I am. I think she's a spectacular editor. And if anything, I go a little flowery, and she tends to sort of reel me back in to be a little more spare. Tell them the Robert Wood Johnson. I can't really use those words, but <laughs> in The Digital Doctor, <laughs> I had a section where I was talking about a study on, about something called uh, Open Notes, which is, as you probably know now, you're, you have a patient portal. If you're, you receive healthcare, you can see all everything, including your doctor's notes. And that was a long movement uh, to democratize healthcare and make notes available. And I did a fellowship that was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the biggest medical foundation in the, in the country. And, um, and so I was talking about this, this, this movement called Open Notes, and I said in a 1989 study funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Katie, a popular book. In a popular at, book. It's a red Aimed at a lay people. audience. And Katie read this, and she clearly, she's got incredible radar for this, saw this as a shout out to this foundation that funded my fellowship. Mm -hmm. And in the margin, there was a note in big red with a circle, and it says, nobody gives an F about the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said- I mean, people do give an F. <laughs> I, I said busted. Not, I mean, she just picked out that this is a shout out. It does not need to be here. The reader doesn't need to see this. It needs to go away. And I said, okay. It's gone. But you've taken care of it. Yeah, right. Just now. Right. <laughs> there it is. I gave, I gave a shout out. There you go. I gave a shout out to the foundation. So who was the first writer? Uh, did someone get started writing first? I mean, I know you're deep in medicine. How did you, did you write before you were in medicine too? Uh, no, I, uh, my first lay-oriented book was uh, after I helped put together the International AIDS Conference that was in San Francisco in 1990. Mm -hmm. And this was before we met. Yeah. And, uh, and so um, I wrote that in 1991. I wrote another lay-oriented book in, nine, in 2005 before we met, and we met in 2009. Mm -hmm. So, and Katie had been writing for decades. I don't want to give away her age, but had been writing for decades <laughs> before that. Thanks. So I write. <laughs> great shout out. You know, I'm, I am, I'm an academic physician who largely has written for the medical literature for mm -hmm. JAMA and the New England Journal. Right and periodically writes for the lay public, whether in op-eds or in books. I mean, Katie is a legit writer, wrote for the New York Times for many, many years, has written seven or eight books and all that. So she's been writing forever. Oh, and the, wait, there was our first argument about your blog, remember, the rumor? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had started a blog. <laughs> 
in the, <laughs> soon after we met, and I heard a rumor about something pretty juicy in a the medical rumor. world. Uh -huh. And I said, I think I need to put this in the blog. And she said, you need like to confirm it and talk to sources, and <laughs> do reporting. And I said, what the hell's that? That's a blog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's easier. <laughs> Okay, you covered for the New York Times, uh, high tech companies out here. For a very long time. Well, Google. I started at Business Week on uh -huh. Battery Street. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and in the mid 80s, covering Apple and John Scully and Steve Jobs and Next, and uh, then went to Newsweek and then went to the Times from there, always in tech. Steve Jobs tried to get you fired, if I recall. Well, Steve, <laughs> yeah, um, so, you know, ev everyone knows the Steve story, but he, um, he was, he really liked to control the press. Oh, and, shocking. Yeah, I know, shocking. <laughs> you stop the press. There's a big reveal here. I know, right? <laughs> and uh, there, he, he made a tactical error once where he wanted to give a story to Newsweek. He ended up calling me in first for this big scoop about Ross Perot investing a bunch of money in Next, and then realized that I was actually going to go back and write it before Newsweek could get it. Mm -hmm. And he went out of his mind because he had lost control. Mm -hmm. And so he spent many days calling me, calling the editor of the New York, of the, I'm sorry, of, of Business Week, where I worked. And um, then I stayed on the Apple slash um, uh, Steve Jobs beat, and he just ha hated everything I wrote. At one point, he we did a big cover story when they when they came out with the the next computer, and um, he called the editor of Business Week and he said, "Katie has done it to me again," <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was really proud because <laughs> you just you know with Steve there was always I don't this isn't like all about Steve Jobs but there was always this tendency to get sucked in mm -hmm. and um, yeah you don't do that no <laughs> <laughs> now I I probably shouldn't ask you this question but. Is there anything in journalist ethics that doesn't allow you to invest in companies that you look at, you know, and say, you know, you we just, just, just investigate all wait, these wait, companies? Wait, wait. I mean, Hold on. We were, we <laughs> you would have. Yeah, I know. You we would, would be retired. Uh, you would be retired. Uh, I understand if you would. If George, you would. okay, so we were <laughs> just talking about this because, no, we could not invest in anything at all, buy no stock at all. And we cannot to this day. I mean, I'm. Yeah. I'm I'm no longer on staff at the Times, but um, the Times' rules are really, really, really rigid. So when Jobs went back in 1997 mm -hmm. to, to Apple, Apple. Yeah. I thought, and it was trading at, I can't even go there. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and trading like it was 27 to, cents. Stop. Yeah, yeah. And so, <laughs> anyway, the one I did, because I wasn't covering this, it was not part of my beat. I did high right. tech. I did when Pete's went public. Mm -hmm. um, I bought stock mm -hmm. and which felt okay to me because you the the rules are you're not supposed to buy stock in anything you cover well actually the rules are you're not supposed to buy stock period so when alfred pete died the obit desk called me and said would you do his obit i said i can't because i have stock <laughs> and and the obit editor very correctly said what are you thinking that is and it's the only stock i've ever unfortunately <laughs> ever <laughs> ever bought. But you you so, knew, you knew Apple was going to do well. When, I knew the minute Jobs went back in '97. So <laughs> I know yeah. it's really. You know the congressmen are supposed to have a rule like that too, but they don't yes. follow it. Supreme either. Court justices too. <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> uh, it's very interesting to find out that the journalists have a stricter, you know. Oh, it's standard. super, super, super. Honey, I love great. you for your ethics. That's, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> we'll muddle through. <laughs> All right. So you did these public writing as well on different things. And you're, one of the, your, your book that we, we are featuring here, The Digital Doctor, is about how medicine is going digital or how it should go digital. So why don't we talk about that big issue for a little while? Why, why do you think 
What, do you, what are the pr pressures, first of all, to do it? And what do you think are the advantages and perhaps any disadvantages? Well, the pressures to do it are, are that there's no business that I can think of that hasn't gone digital. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the pressures to go digital are how do you do work these days if you don't take advantage of technology? Mm -hmm. So medicine, maybe with the exception of education, was the only outlier until about 10 or 12 years ago that whose way of, I mean, medicine's all about collecting data. If I see you as a patient, I'm asking you questions, I'm writing them down, I'm analyzing that, I'm trying to make a diagnosis, I'm then saying for this diagnosis, the best treatment is this because the medical literature says it. It's all about collecting data and using data on the, in the purpose of trying to improve human health. So the fact that until 10 or 12 years ago, the way I then would have collected data and written it down was scribbling on a piece of paper, mm -hmm. illegibly, <laughs> faxing things. We were the greatest users of fax machines in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Post-it notes, that was the way we collected and moved data around, it was craziness. Mm -hmm. And every other industry, if you think about finance, if you think about entertainment, if you think about travel, every other industry had gone digital decades before we did. So there was tremendous pressure to do it, but the reason that we didn't do it was it was pretty disruptive to our way of doing things, and the economics of healthcare are pretty funky. Mm -hmm. You know, in other industries, you decide to invest in computers based on if I do this, am I gonna be more productive and, and are the economics gonna pay off? And in healthcare, because of insurance and third-party payment and all those things, the economics don't quite line up the way they do in more traditional industries. So it wasn't until about 2008 when the federal government uh, provided about $30 billion of incentive payments, which was not needed for every other industry, but in medicine we needed incentive payments to get us to adopt electronic health records. Mm -hmm. And so over the past 10 years, 10 or 12 years, we went from almost no one having electronic health records to every hospital, every doctor's office in the country essentially collecting data and moving it around electronically. And it's useful and it's definitely better. And anybody who tells you it's made things worse is crazy. It's definitely made things better. But it struck me about six or seven years ago that it wasn't as good as it should have been. There was a lot of complaining about it from doctors, from patients. My doctor's not looking me in the eye anymore. It looks like my doctor's spending yeah. all of his or her time right. you know, staring at the computer, just being an expensive data entry clerk. And so I, I actually said to Katie one night, and, and, and at UCSF, which is, I need to say, a fantastic place, <laughs> but we committed amazing medical mistake where we gave a kid a 40-fold overdose of an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And it happened, as I heard the case, and how it happened, it could not have happened when we were on paper. It was the nature of the problem was this electronic system mm -hmm. that created sort of a whole bunch of crazy signals and people had turned their brains off. They said, the computer says the right dose right. is a 40 fold overdose. That's what I came home and I said, I think I need to write about this. And Katie said, that's a great idea for a book. So I spent a year of my life writing a book about why the digital transformation of healthcare has been so challenging. And uh, it still is, it still is. If you ask doctors today what their main complaint is and the level of burnout is quite high, they will say their electronic inbox. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a patient, you now have a patient portal, mm -hmm. whether you're at UCSF or another place, you have a patient portal and it has all of your information on it. But we, including doctor's notes, including your lab tests, your x-rays, your EKGs, that's all great and progress. But you'll get a thing that says your magnesium is low or your EKG is abnormal. We give you absolutely no help in trying to figure out what that means. Mm. And then we have a little button that says, send a message to your doctor. Mm -hmm. And of course, if I was a patient, that sounds great. Sure, why not? Click. <laughs> and from the doctor's standpoint, they get done after a 10 hour work day. They put the kids to bed and they've got two or three hours of emails to plow through answering all these questions. Mm -hmm. So I think we really just did not understand or think through all of the consequences of shifting from paper-based work to digital work. I still think it's, a, it's the right thing to do. It's actually gonna make medicine better and safer and all ultimately less expensive, but it's, it's a very, very bumpy road. You know, if you were in the legal profession, you would have solved the problem immediately because the way the lawyers did it when they, yeah. when they made that transition, they charged by the hour for- Not by the hour, every six minutes. Or every six time minutes. I check with my lawyer. For, for, <laughs> for, the, for the emails. Yes, and, of course. And that keeps it down a little bit. And we are <laughs> starting to do that quite mm -hmm. controversially, but uh -huh. I think we have come to recognize that, that the physicians actually are doing medical work and you can't do it for free. And on the other hand, the patients have, 
part of it is going to be trying to figure out an economic model for this, mm. but part of it is going to be addressing their problems in ways that don't necessarily have to go to the doctor. Some of it can right. be done by digital, by technology. Some of it can be done by other individuals that are part of the team. Yeah. All right. So your new thing was uh, going digital in the last book round. You're, after being a journalist for a long time, you wrote a novel. I wrote a novel, and, right. And, 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 and you, you must have thought, shall I, I mean, that must have been something new, something new to decide. And how did you make that choice? And, and, uh, and did it work out? <laughs> did, well, did it work out? Okay, well, let's see. All right, well, so how it started. Um, so uh, I've, I've, um, so I've written seven books, mm -hmm. um, nonfiction, mostly about tech, one about music, Glenn Gould's obsession with his piano, another, I lived in um, Berlin for several years and mm -hmm. I wrote a book about the reunification of Germany. Um, and um, my, I've always wanted to go on one of those high-end bike trips where, mm -hmm. you know, your only job all day is to ride your bike. And um, they carry your luggage. It's amazing. And um, and so my daughter and I went on one. Mm -hmm. Now he's seen too many ER, like... <laughs> <laughs> a little scared. A little scared. So my daughter and I went, and we did Stockholm to Copenhagen, which, honey, is very flat and is that safe. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's and flat. That's a, that was a good, flat. good choice. Yeah. Not and the so Alps, no. at dinner one night, <laughs> one of the guides, um, you know, I was curious because we you're thrown together for this week um and they're all you're all kind of strangers except you're thrown together and so you get to know each other and the question in my mind was well what if there's like a squeaky wheel what if there's someone who's kind of a problem mm -hmm. and so i asked um and since bob wasn't there that eliminated that problem and <laughs> so <laughs> So sorry. That's right, dear. Go okay, on. so um, just a shout out. So yeah, just a shout out to Bob. <laughs> you would not have liked this mic. <laughs> so um, I said to the guy, uh, "What happens if there's a problem guest?" And he said, "Well, they get a letter." And I said, "A letter? Like from whom?" <laughs> and He's, he said, well, from the CEO of the company. And I said, well, what does it say? And he said, it says, thank you very much for coming on our trip. Never, ever come back. <laughs> and, and I said, who gets that kind of letter? So he told me this one great story of this couple at the first night at dinner. The husband says to the wife, you didn't pack my socks. And the wife says, I want a divorce. And so <laughs> then I said, that's great. And who, like, who else? And then he told this amazing story. And he said, well, this super bizarre thing happened. And my daughter said, mom, that's a novel. Ah, she and would I, tell you the super bizarre thing, but that is the spoiler of the right, book. Right, right, right. Yes. You got to read the book. So um, <laughs> I thought, oh, that's great. Someone will write it. And then I don't know, George, I don't know. I just thought... Like a few months later, I was just, I woke up one morning and you know how you're in that dream state mm -hmm. when you, and I, I just thought, you know, I'm going to try to tap out on my phone, like the first scene. Mm -hmm. And then it turned into this novel and to my agent's great credit, mm -hmm. he didn't say, Katie, stay in your lane. He, <laughs> he said, this is really promising. Uh-huh. And so that was... Well, I have to say, I think it's spectacular, and I'm obviously biased, but I think it's spectacular. It is pretty unusual for someone who spent their entire career as a journalist and who's written six nonfiction books to make the transition mm -hmm. to writing a novel. It's, yeah. just a, it's a totally different skill set. And uh, it's, I think it's a really impressive and actually quite wonderful book. And as Katie, you know, go ahead, you can tell. <laughs> and you, and you, as you, so you don't, Bob, Bob doesn't actually read books. And, <laughs> but he, he read, if you ask him, because he read The Boys, 20 times. Well, and so you, good. When Katie said, like, how many books does Bob read a year? And Katie says, well, he read 20 last year, <laughs> the boys 20 times. So, <laughs> I actually read a fair amount of, of non politics, yeah. nonfiction, yeah. Yeah. some medicine, but I'm not a novel Fiction. person. So yeah. the fact that this captivated me right. is, uh, is impressive. Like when we met, mm -hmm. I was telling him that my great love 
in literature is Kafka. And he said, the guy with the bug? <laughs> I thought that was pretty reasonable. You're <laughs> the thinking of it as a medical condition. Right, right exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't know, that, I didn't think that's where that story was going to go, I, you know, to the novel. I, I thought what it was going to be that you were, you were going to get one of those letters from the CEO. No. <laughs> oh, no, they never were good, come they back. were good campers. No, they yeah. were fine. Yeah. <laughs> So you, you wrote this novel. Did it take longer to write it than I it, thought uh, it would take no time at all because you just make stuff up. So you're not doing research. Right? But, right. Like, <laughs> and because all the other books have taken pretty reliably three years per book. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a ton of work. And I thought, great. I just sit there and like whatever pops into my head. It's not that way at all. It's, <laughs> and well, part so, of it is you're doing a ton of research. Well, I had to actually go on this. And then, since the book takes place, the, the bike ride in the book, there's a big bike ride in the book. Mm -hmm. And it takes place in Italy, so I had to, like, of course, go had to. On, an, on an... Luckily, we had the proceeds of the Apple stock to pay for that. <laughs> that, that worked out well. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah, and, and a lot of my reporting for the Times, sort of, I... Um, applied mm -hmm. to a lot of have you read the boys oh you have um, you no, have I a great treat in store so <laughs> it's it's a lark i mean it goes very quickly and uh so one of the main characters she um she studies she's a um a psychologist and and she's she studies the field of of um sort of loneliness and social isolation mm -hmm. among older adults and that's a a piece that i had done for the new york times that took me about six months to do, and I actually went to England. There's a scene in the in the book where she goes to England and she sits in on this loneliness hotline, mm -hmm. which is just heartbreaking. And so my story for the Times, I sort of use that mm -hmm. to to inform you know that character. Right. And so let's talk about that. And that that was one of the issues on my list. An issue? What, <laughs> is the loneliness of of, oh. of, of of older people, because. Because it, it, we were talking before about medicine becoming more impersonal, people just thinking that it's you know digitalized and people aren't looking in each other's eyes anymore and that kind of thing, and and obviously with everybody using it, the computers. You you also mentioned how um, people trusted in this case uh, where forty times thing they trusted the computer over their own judgment. Correct. And I think the older the, peop the people are, the less that happens. And I, I, we live at the end of a cul-de-sac that's right next to the Lafayette Reservoir. And when people first started having the maps uh, on their phones in 2005, 2006, people would come up to the end of that to me because one of the maps was wrong. It said that that was the entrance to the reservoir. It wasn't the entrance at all. Mm -hmm. And I noticed a big difference between the ages of the people who were driving. If somebody was over 35, they would see this and see, see that there was no entrance and turn around and leave. And if they were between 25 and 35, they would look around and- Just drive through the fence. Dri drive through, they didn't <laughs> drive through the fence, but they, they tried to look around and see, it must be near here somewhere. Yeah. And if they were under 25, they often stayed 10 minutes trying, I, I, I always imagine, trying to make reality match the computer. Really? You know, and so I figure as time goes on, that was 2005, and it's almost yeah. 20 years later. Yeah. As time goes on and people are used to this trust in the computer, Will those mistakes happen more often? Yes, no question. Yeah, I mean, it was one of I interviewed about a hundred people for my book and uh, on technology and healthcare, and one of them was Sully Sullenberger, who's who's a friend, mm -hmm. and we were talking about a series of aviation accidents that had occurred over the past twenty years, and a theme for many of them was that the technology got glitchy. And the pilots, and I remember Sully saying to me, the pilot was now flying a plane that he was unfamiliar with, mm -hmm. which is a plane that was no longer guided by the technology. Mm -hmm. And it is true that for an older generation, you remember there's an instinct in there, there's muscle memory about what it was like before the technology, and therefore your capacity to question, this seems weird and mm -hmm. funky, is that right, is just greater than a generation that has gotten used to being reliant on the technology. And as we talk about kind of the new generation of artificial intelligence and whether it's gonna replace doctors and that it's making diagnoses as well as doctors are, the most interesting question I think is, 
what happens when the technology is right 98% of the time? Mm -hmm. And the answer is the human response will be the humans will turn their brains off so that even if the, uh, the idea is the technology is suggesting diagnoses, but the doctor is still the person ultimately in charge, that's akin to your, you know, your driverless car mm -hmm. saying, stay awake and stay alert because this thing could make a left turn into a concrete pillar at any moment. Mm -hmm. Who can possibly do that if the thing is, is, is operating correctly 99.8% of the time? You, the human will turn their brain off. I've said to people before, I actually don't remember Katie's cell phone number. I mean, if I ever lose my cell phone, I'm not sure we'll see each other again. Because <laughs> I, I mean, I just don't need to remember it. It's in there. Yeah. And it's just a human response to sort of focus on the things you need to remember. And it's one of the great challenges in technology. It's sort of it's wonderful when it's 100 percent right. And when it's 70 percent right, the human understands it's imperfect and I've got to stay vigilant. Mm -hmm. It's in that 90, 95, 98 percent where it gets very, very dangerous. And I do worry about that with medicine. Mm -hmm. So let's go from there to COVID a little bit, because uh, medicine here is uh, we use a new vaccine, a new kind of vaccine for it. Um, there's been a lot of pushback uh, by part of the population and part of the population is very happy about it. Um, and so why don't you talk about it from the point of view of writing it up? I mean, trying to describe it. Why do you think or, or is there is there a way that we could be more persuasive to the to both sides, maybe to both parts of that? Because some some people are are accepting whatever is said and some people are unaccepting whatever is said. Mm. Well, COVID was, you know, COVID happened to hit in an era where there is a tremendous amount of questioning of expertise and of credentialed experts. And, they, you know, I obviously don't have to tell anybody a massive amount of partisanship. So if somebody says the sky is blue, someone else has to say the sky is not blue. And so and vaccines and medicine in general is pretty tricky when it comes to that kind of environment. First of all, it's an environment now and when I was growing up in healthcare, there was one way to get information out. You sent an article to a journal and an editor, or actually a series of peer reviewers of the journal would vet the article and decide if, whether it was true. And then if it was true, they would, and it was useful, they would publish it. Mm -hmm. And maybe then a newspaper, whichever one it was, would say that's worthy of an article in the New York Times. And that's mm -hmm. how, those were the only mechanisms by which information could make it out to the public. Obviously, it's all gone. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there is unfiltered information that can make it out through a hundred different portals uh, without any intermediaries, no vetting and no editors. And vaccines, I think, are particularly tricky because the minute the uh, evidence came out about the new vaccines, I, one of the things I tweeted was, in the month after people get their vaccines, I can guarantee to you that something like 20,000 people will have heart attacks mm -hmm. and 15,000 people will have strokes and 50,000 people will break their legs. And if you're of a mindset that says the vaccine is bad because the other side said it's good, you will say the vaccine caused the heart attack, the stroke, the broken leg, the whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a formula for chaos. I mean, it really is a formula for uh, people not believing what is in their interest to believe. And I think the vaccines are a beautiful example. The vaccines are miracles. The vaccines are unbelievably effective, mm -hmm. but confusing uh, and become more confusing over time because their benefit in terms of preventing severe cases is different than their benefit in preventing all cases. And if you remember when they came out, mm -hmm. we talked about nobody's going to get COVID anymore because you got vaccinated. And then all of a sudden there were these, quote, breakthrough infections. And people say, well, I was told that they that wouldn't happen. And it clearly did. And then there's a benefit in terms of preventing long COVID. And so if it gets partisanized, which it has, if people don't believe credentialed experts, but believe whoever the random person is on the internet, then you have a world where you have a huge part of the population not doing something that is in their self-interest, which is to get vaccinated and get boosted. It's massively upsetting, but, and I actually worry a lot about it beyond COVID, there's, n there's no reason that whatever incentive it is that people have to purvey misinformation, and some of it's economic and some of it is 
I don't understand really. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they, they, for some reason, get some pleasure out of harming people. I don't see any reason why that wouldn't extend from COVID to other vaccines, which it has. And I don't understand why it wouldn't extend from other vaccines to you shouldn't get this treatment for your blood pressure mm-hmm. or for your atrial fibrillation or for right. your cholesterol. You know, there's no bright line between vaccines and the rest of medicine. So it's a pretty scary time. And I think the fundamentals are social media mm-hmm. and the questioning of all things that relate to expertise. Are you already seeing that the blood pressure? And- Not so much yet, but I think it's just got to happen. It's, there hasn't been an organized effort, maybe because it doesn't have the same level of public attention or scrutiny. Or uh, And vaccines have always had a piece of this, the whole vaccine autism right. thing. There's always been a particular set of kind of conspiracy theories and misinformation around vaccines more than other parts of medicine. But I don't see any good reason. I don't, just don't see a bright line between the rest of medicine and vaccination. Mm-hmm. It seems also part of a bigger social um, shift and also the split, which is, you know, science based data is and the scientific method is based on uncertainty. And don't say, we, we know this 100%. Yeah. It's, it's this and that. And people want certainty. Right. And I think as the benefits of science were so obvious for a while, there was a sort of shift towards it. But, you know, but people get used to that. And I think that they want the certainty more than they want the benefits. Well, it's it? not even just certain. I mean, part, part of what was interesting about tweeting about COVID and all, it's all probabilistic. I mean, do you get a vaccine? Do you get a booster? Do you wear a mask? Do you eat indoors? It's not like there's a right answer and a wrong answer. There are probabilities associated with all of these choices and they're hard and they're, and they're different for you than they are for me. And my, the way I weigh them might be different. So that's really hard. And the certainty that I had yesterday may be different tomorrow because because the world has changed. We learned something new and that's called science. But in the current environment, something changes and you say, look, I knew not to believe that guy because he told me this and it's wrong. Right. It's really very, very upsetting. When you talked right about I was going to quote you. See. All right. What I'm doing for a living is weighing the benefits and the risks for everything, says Dr. Robert yeah, that, that, in, in that's back a couple of years ago. And, and, and that is. <laughs> That is, you know, something that is obviously extremely useful, um, but is another paradigm that that people aren't going to take a long time to get used to, I think, because they and I'll bet there'll be recurrences of interest in things will will tell you a certain answer. Yeah. Regardless of whether it's the right answer or not, but it's a certain answer. Do you want to talk about your boo boo? My boo boo? (laughs) (laughs) Only if George wants to. Go right ahead. Well, I'm not going to get in the way of that one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, as some folks probably know, because it, it, it got a lot of media, I did not have COVID for three years, was reasonably careful, and I think also moderately lucky. Um, and then two months ago, I got COVID, and it was a fairly bad case. And I woke up the morning after and, and had sweated all night and was he dehydrated. He called me. What's that? You, you looked horrible. I was in New Hampshire, he, which is where I spent a lot of the summer. He called me and he looked awful. He said, I'm really feverish. I said, honey, you've got COVID. He said, no, no, I took a test. <laughs> uh, I wasn't sure I didn't have it, but the first test was negative. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so then I didn't hear anything yeah. until, until the our daughter room. called. Oh, yeah, or, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I took a hot shower because I felt like crud and it was dehydrated and sweaty and all that. And that's the last thing I remember. I left, I came out of the shower Mm -hmm. and the next thing I knew I was sort of staggered, didn't know where I was, pulled myself up to look in the mirror and had huge gashes Mm. on my face. And then I looked down at, there's a, uh, there's a trash can right next to the toilet Mm -hmm. and it had a a very distinct face shaped indentation. (laughs) Um, Did you say distinct or distinguished? Distinct. It was, it was, it was was big and it was my face. uh, So I had completely passed out. Mm -hmm. Uh, which happens in, uh, this is something called a vasovagal reaction, where you're dehydrated and uncomfortable, your blood pressure can just give out, and I passed out. And you've saved a lot of lives because so many people have said, I had no idea. That that could happen, right? So I decided to, to, so anyway, that day, our um, future son-in-law, who's a doctor in, in, in training in my program, 
texted me in the morning because he knew I felt a crummy the night before. He said, how are you feeling this morning? And I said, I need a lift to the emergency room. I'm going to need stitches because I had huge gashes in my mm -hmm. face. So I had the distinction of going to my emergency room at UCSF <laughs> with COVID as my problem, but it was listed as the fifth problem on my <laughs> list. First that I passed out, the second I had a small hemorrhage, small uh, blood clot around my brain. Mm -hmm. The third is I'd fractured one of my vertebrae. Oh. So I could have easily died. I could have easily been a quadriplegic. I got very, very lucky. Wow. Wow. And Katie says the scar adds a lot of characters. So, <laughs> <laughs> that. so that like was my introduction to COVID. Just like the duelers in the 1900s in, in yes, Vienna, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> See the other guy. And did you, did you think that you just, when you went to take the shower, you just thought, shower time you didn't no, i felt crummy and 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 sweaty and needed a shower yeah. so i mean i i think you know nine times out of ten or 99 out of 100 it would have been fine mm -hmm. it just happened this time the combination of how bad i was feeling plus mm -hmm. dehydration and what a shower does is it a hot shower will dilate your blood vessels in your right. legs so your blood pools in your extremities and your brain gets very unhappy when it doesn't have enough blood well you've mentioned several times tweeting and we know you've tweeted a lot about COVID, um, you've got a lot easier of, than saying Xing. I can't do no, that. No, 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 yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, but uh, I'm curious to start tweeting about COVID as the chair of medicine at UCSF. Did somebody younger make that suggestion to you, or did you <laughs> your younger self did? <laughs> or did you just come up with that yourself? I'm sorry. Well, first of all, everybody's younger. So, um, <laughs> no, I started tweet. I have for the last ten or fifteen years liked the idea of using social media to do what I think I'm here to do, which is try to get good knowledge out to people in a way that helps them. Mm -hmm. And there's a way of doing that, which is publishing an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, but there are other ways of doing that. So I've been blogging for a long time, was tweeting for several years about the things I was interested in, technology and other things. And when COVID hit, <laughs> I remember in mid-March 2020, I was hiding under my kitchen table. I was spending an enormous amount of time hearing huge amounts of information about this thing. You know, I've got the world's experts in virology and vaccinology and aerosol science who work in my department. And I actually didn't have that much to do running my department because we basically had gone to martial law. There were no decisions to be made. Mm -hmm. A small group of people, and I was not one of them, was basically determining all of the policy issues for the, for the institution. Mm -hmm. And I just said, I think this is the most important issue in the world. It's confusing as hell. People are gonna need up-to-date information about it. And my hesitation was, I am, I'm a general internist and, mm -hmm. and I'm not the world's expert on vaccines or virology or whatever. But I came to believe that there would be a lane for people that kind of understood the whole thing and could take all this information and package it and put it out in a way that people found useful. Mm. I did that. Ashish Jha, who ended up becoming the White House COVID coordinator, who was mm. an old friend, did that. Eric Topol did that. Several of us sort of took that lane. And I, when COVID hit, I had 15,000 followers. And by the time, you know, six months ago, I had 300,000. Mm -hmm. And I did not become any more interesting in the last three years. So that <laughs> was, it was a massive demand for good yeah. information. And it was, I thought, quite gratifying. The other thing I did, this was quite purposeful, was decided that one of the things I could do would, take, would be take the information, try to explain it, <clears throat> but also try then to turn it into practical form like this is what I am doing. Mm -hmm. This is what I am recommending. This is why mm -hmm. I don't know that you should do this, but this is how I'm thinking about these decisions. And I think a lot of people found that useful. And I was also comfortable and this became a little tricky and I'm actually grateful to UCSF for allowing this. A lot of places are top down enough that they would not have allowed me to be as personal as I was. Mm -hmm. But I was, you know, I remember early on saying I'm scared out of my wits that I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. When my younger son got COVID, I remember writing that, you know, he was still testing positive on day six when the CDC said he was good to go. And I said, I love him to pieces, but I wouldn't want to hug him. Mm -hmm. And the Twitter people went crazy. Oh, you are such a terrible parent. There's nothing my kid could have that would make me not want to hug him. I said, are you crazy? He's got a potentially <laughs> fatal disease, you know, <laughs> and he's 28 years old. I can go three days without hugging him. <laughs> so, it just turned out that it was, it was extremely gratifying. It really felt like, you know, it's part of what we're here to do is make a difference in the way people think about important things. And, and it turned out to be, that was the right forum to do it. 
Has your son gotten over that? He has gotten over that, yes. <laughs> Took a while, but he did get over that. So Katie, um, in, your, in your work and in your writing and everything, you've covered so many different topics. I have. What are the ones that kind of really mm. got under your skin head and have stayed there ever since? You know I mean? That some, you keep following and you keep following, yeah. even though you're not writing about it anymore. So. Well, the, the loneliness and social isolation piece really, really mm -hmm. um, hit me hard. Uh, I'd spent a year working on, um, uh, it's gonna sound weird, dermatology. Mm -hmm. And um, it was an investigative piece on, um, how older people were being um, taken advantage of, mostly in Florida, but in other places too, just being told they needed all these things that they didn't actually need and sort mm. of Medicare fraud. And I did another piece that really stuck with me on um, uh, Catholic hospitals and mm. the um, and the care they would not give um, in mm. reproductive medicine. Um, and that was another investigative piece. Uh, and but I mean, then the, say that I mean, part of what's motivating her now is she got really she's really passionate about women in science, mm -hmm. and that's what led to to her podcast. Yeah, years and years and years ago, I did a story for the Sunday Times. Thirty, it was thirty years ago that I I call very fondly girl nerds, mm -hmm. and um, it was about women in science, mostly about um, women at MIT and how they became engineers and computer scientists. And it's still computer science is still sort of grievously underrepresented by women. Anyway, and so um, I still do some work for the Times, mostly obits and advance obit. Uh, advance obits and but I run now um, a podcast called um, Lost Women of Science where women through history uh, it's such a it's such a um, uh, it's just wrong to think that there were women through history who were not amazing scientists and um, our what we say is that for every Marie Curie or Rosalind Franklin out there whose story has been told, there are thousands, and I mean thousands, of women who did amazing things in science whose stories have not been told. And so in the podcast, we're, a, we're an educational nonprofit, me running a... Uh, th anything, um, <laughs> as Bob can tell you. Um, uh, but we're a 501c3. Um, we have a wonderful set of producers and engineers, and we're an initiative called the Lost Women of Science Initiative. And um, so we're this educational nonprofit, and um, we tell these stories. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we like to say, or I like to say, is, you know, we're not mad, we're curious. Okay, <laughs> we're a little mad. <laughs> and so we've told, um, we've been around for um, almost three years. We started during COVID, and we've had great funding from Gordon and Betty Moore mm -hmm. and the Alfred P. Sloan F Foundation. And... But Listeners not the Robert like, Wood Johnson Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> See, if you'd let me keep that in. <laughs> They're going to be so happy with you that you didn't let them keep that <laughs> in. <laughs> anyway, I do have to say that for all the years that I've been a journalist, this is there's something about telling these stories that is profoundly gratifying. Mm -hmm. Like to, to snatch these women from the jaws of historical obscurity is just... It means really quite a lot to me. Yeah, I, I can understand why we. I've done a lot of programs in different areas, and one of them was uh, on Voltaire, and it was about his mistress, who, right, right. Who, who translated Newton into French for everybody. I mean, she was the one that conveyed Newton's ideas to the to mm -hmm. the entire French population at that time. And another one uh, on on uh, Pythagoreans. There was something about 800 years after Pythagoras. Of, say 600 BC, so about 200 AD, and one of their historians wrote, "Who were the 300 most influential Pythagorean thinkers in the last 800 years?" And 34 of them were women hmm. in, oh, wow. in that society, and I, and I think that that's just sort of representative of what's been missing and mm -hmm. what's been lost, and and uh, other people taking advantage of of uh, you know, I know that professors never take advantage of their grad students in this way. But, but 
you know, that's just the, the kind of thing that's happened all along. And it's not just male versus female, male versus male, et cetera, et cetera. But it certainly has been that way for a long, long time. It's great that you can keep bringing out the stories. And as you know, as you just said, so many of the stories are lost and lost, lost. So mm -hmm. it's lost, good to bring lost, out lost. the ones that, that, mm -hmm. that are not totally lost. Yep. That's great. Well, we have uh, questions coming in from the, uh, our in-person audience and also from our online audience listening to the live stream. So I'm going to ask both of you to answer this question. Uh, what is the best piece of professional or personal advice that you've received and who was it from? I guess they want you to shout out to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be the Robin uh, Wood Robert Johnson. <laughs> Robert Wood Johnson. Would you like to do that first? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I think the I got advice early on. It sounds too trite to even say, but it was really to follow your passion mm -hmm. and to be comfortable zigging and zagging. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my... Uh, fairly early in my career, I was asked to run the, the International AIDS Conference in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and it was the wrong thing to do in terms of the academic trajectory I was on. Mm -hmm. But I had a mentor who said, this would be crazy for most people, but for you, it's a good idea. <laughs> because I was, you know, I was I was a political science major in college. I was incredibly interested in sort of the interface between politics and medicine and so uh -huh. on. And the conference turned out to be this incredible crucible of, of that. Right. Uh, and I ended up writing a book about the politics of AIDS, and, and it led to other things that I did. And, and then my first job as a faculty member at UCSF was sort of a very traditional research-oriented job. And I wasn't very good at it and kind of failed at it and um, had mentors who said to me, you know, that's, you know, that's just not your thing. Here are other things that you mm. can do. And so in the next couple of days, I'm going to give a few talks to orient our new faculty at UCSF. And probably the main point I will make is you will have a career trajectory in mind, and it's probably good to have it in mind, but assume that's not going to be the way your career goes no. and be comfortable mm -hmm. with that. It's like going on a vacation. You can have an overall plan, but you know, if you try to stick to it, you're, yep. you're not going to have a fun vacation. Exactly mm -hmm. right. Here, here, remember that. I will remember that. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> so, <laughs> Sorry, so I didn't mean to step my, in with that. <laughs> so mine is kind of in reverse. So I, uh, you know, journalists are should be skeptical of, of of things, but journalists should also like look around every corner. And one of the, if nobody here has seen this. You must see this amazing documentary about um, Robert Gottlieb and, and Robert Caro called mm. Turn Every Page. And I love that documentary so much. And one of the things that Caro says, and that's why it's called Turn Every Page, is that he just learned very young to like turn the page to see what was a. And this is what has made me just a terribly slow reporter mm. is that I just keep thinking that what is around the next corner, what is in the on the next page, there might be something more. And I, nobody specific gave me that advice, but some of my best sort of mentors mm. through the years, uh, not just at the times, but um, but everywhere, it's like that idea of just see what see what's around the next corner it's a hard so. way to live because you're always you know you don't know when you're done mm -hmm. you don't know when you're done and sometimes you're doing it just to stall because you don't want to write <laughs> <laughs> be careful it's, it's good the, for that too yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but see you, everyone must see that documentary it's so great <laughs> All right, here's another question uh, from our audience here. Why did the CDC initially in the pandemic urge us to not wear masks and did they irreparably injure their authority in doing so? I don't know if the CDC said that. Fauci said that famously. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I actually know Tony fairly well and I think he's mm -hmm. an incredibly impressive guy, an amazing public servant. Uh, he thought that, first of all, we don't know how it's transmitted and did not think that, that, that aerosols would be the way it was transmitted. But secondly, he knew there would be a massive mask shortage and that we needed to have masks in hospitals mm -hmm. and other healthcare settings. Uh, but it, saying it, it was a mistake because it turned out that masks worked reasonably well and that when both the CDC and Fauci pivoted, it became, look, we can't trust him. And mm -hmm. that you know, that, of course, led to all of a lot of the stuff that that followed. Uh, so but it was one of those areas 
we'd never seen COVID before. We hadn't seen a global pandemic for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And so all you can do is extrapolate from what you know. And what people knew was the transmission, for example, of flu, which is a little bit less mask dependent than COVID is. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were a lot of our, our initial mental model for it turned out to be wrong in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened with the vaccines. The vac if you remember the vaccines came out, mm -hmm. the early studies said you get the vaccine, you will not get infected. Mm -hmm. And then the CDC said, you know, breakthrough infections are rare. And I kept haranguing them and saying, no, they're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you're going to lose your credibility if you keep saying that because mm -hmm. people are seeing this, you know, you're saying don't believe your eyes. So sometimes you get it wrong because the new information comes out and says it's wrong, but you've got to be able to admit that and pivot quickly. And I don't think we've done that very well. Mm -hmm. It's also, I mean, people's lives were at stake and it's a very dangerous situation and all the difference in the world between, you know, what's the rate of, of death that comes from this and didn't know at the beginning. I mean, I was working in New York when the AIDS uh, crisis happened as well. And everybody knew right away, I mean, this is almost like a death sentence. It was like it was, almost 100%, 100%, you know? Yeah. And, and, and so that's the, when people hear about a pandemic and they have this model in the background, which for the first 10 or 15 years, it was 100% death sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, it wasn't as transmissible. Right, right, you know, very hard. If you if you had the transmissibleness of COVID and the death rate of the other, I mean, well, I, I we would have given up. to right? be the skunk in the room, but yeah. I, 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 one of the things, I did a whole lot of interviews about COVID during right. the course of the pandemic. And I interviewed a guy named Mike Osterholm, who people may have seen, he's a professor at the University of Minnesota and a really world-class pandemic expert. He's been studying this for 40 years, has written books about pandemics. And I haven't. I mean, I really became a pandemic expert when COVID hit. And I said, Mike, you know, how does it feel to have warned about the big one for 40 years? And finally, here it is. And he said, this wasn't the big one. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. whoa. And he said, it's just not that hard to imagine a pathogen that is as transmissible as COVID was, but has 10 times the fatality rate, has mm. the fatality rate of Ebola. Mm. That's just math. I mean, that just happens <laughs> right. to be what combination of mutations. We know that things can be more fatal. We know things can be more infectious. It's not impossible that that'll get packaged together. So that's, uh, that's kind of scary. Mm. And we weren't all that good with this one. So <laughs> I'm right. not convinced we'll be but, that much But we've tonight. learned. I hope. <laughs> learned a little, not enough. Not enough. All right. Um, uh, what hope is there for long-term solutions to prevent COVID, long COVID? Um, the nasal sprays are brought up, or will we be masking forever? <laughs> well, clearly we won't be masking forever because people are not doing that. wearing masks anymore. I mean, yeah. people have really, by and large, <clears throat> decided that the threat has gone below whatever threshold they have to stay careful. And I understand that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's been three years and we're now almost into our fourth year. It's exhausting. There's some joy of not thinking about it very much. And that the world is different. I mean, the state of immunity, there is no one who is not immune at this point. There's no one who doesn't have some combination of vaccine or infection related immunity or both. And so the threat is far lo lower than it was. Uh, the nasal vaccines, I know some people are very enthusiastic about them. The idea is you put a vaccine spritz in your nose and it will prevent transmission. The problem is, are you going to do that every day or every week? It's not clear how often you'd have to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that COVID will be with us forever. Mm -hmm. I think the threat will ebb and flow. Right now it's up a little bit, not mm -hmm. super high, but higher than it was a month ago. I think it'll come down, it'll go up again. And to me, it's, it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. It's sort of the minute you're done, you've got to start all over again. Mm -hmm. And the minute you have COVID under control, people stop being quite as careful. Our immunity goes down a little bit because fewer people get infected. People don't get their boosters mm -hmm. and we'll see spikes again. Hopefully, if it's with the same variants or versions of the same variants, the spikes won't be severe. They'll probably be like what we see now. Mm -hmm. And it's dealer's choice whether to be careful. I'm still being moderately careful. I'm not masking now mm -hmm. because I was infected seven weeks ago. So the immunity I have from that infection will still be pretty good against preventing infection for another couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But then I'll go back to wearing a mask in crowded places. And I mm -hmm. think I'll do that anytime there's a, a spike in COVID rates. And I'll probably do that forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I lived in Hong Kong back in the 70s, and a lot of people wore masks. Yeah. Uh, you know, when they, especially when they were infected. But but you know, this, but the sociology there was everybody's wearing a mask; it's okay. Right. I mean, here we're now at a point, maybe not quite so much in San Francisco, but in other parts of the country, like you wear a mask and people are looking at you like you're crazy, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's tricky. That's tricky to sort of have enough, you know, fortitude to say, I don't care what you think; I still want to protect myself. Right. And I'll protect you, even though you think I'm crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Katie, do you want to say a word about long COVID or no? Yeah. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Well, I had a version, sort of, maybe, of it. um, And it was unpleasant. What else should I say? Well, Katie had COVID a year and a half ago now. And um, she, you know, it wasn't a terribly bad case. Mm -hmm. But three, four, five months later, she still needed to take a nap in the middle of every day, which she never had to do before. Mm -hmm. She still had some brain fog, which she never had before. She'd kind of get a little forgetful of things. And as you see, she doesn't like to call it long COVID, Mm -hmm. but it was. I mean, it was was a classic case of long COVID. Um, You know, we know there are certain things that lower the chance of getting it, vaccination, Paxlovid, uh, but there, at, at least at this point, there's no proven treatment for any of it. Mm-hmm. Luckily, she's gotten so much better over the last six months, and mm-hmm. that is the natural history in some people that it gets better. But it's a pretty daunting thing when you think about probably 5 to 10% of people get COVID, get some version of it. So many of them far more disabled than she is. but Far more. She minimizes it, but it's clearly had a... Napping was great. Oh, she liked napping. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, you know, people... After they got the measles, they never thought about getting shingles, you know, all mm-hmm. these years later, right? Yeah. That kind of thing. So. Chicken pox. Chicken pox, sorry. Chicken pox, yeah. One of those. Our, our family, it was all before vaccination, but I have 11 brothers and sisters, and so we just have this record, you know, mumps would come in, and the one would get it, and then Everybody. the next one, next one, yeah. next one. Then we'd have measles, next one, next one, German measles, chicken pox. Wow. And then all the younger ones didn't get anything because they got mm-hmm. vaccinated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's amazing. People forget about that. Yeah, the vaccines have been amazing. It's, it is a little tragic when people, uh, you know, denigrate them or overemphasize the downsides. There are, you know, there are risks, but they are very, very small compared to the mm-hmm. benefits. And, you know, it is what it is. So, Katie, you were at the beginning of the, we're going to go back to the, the high tech things for a second here, uh, with one of the questions about Google. So you're at the beginning. No, of, no, that one too. And, and, oh, yeah. uh, and, and <laughs> they were just wondering, what do you see as the role of these high tech companies from their start to, to now and in, in the way that they influence our society uh, much stronger than before? Were you able to see that that was possible when they were when they were new or have you followed it and said, oh, my gosh, it's getting worse or or that's you so useful to our society? That, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. That's yeah, I um, I'll try to make this quick. So when I started at the Times, I was at a section that came out every Thursday called Circuits. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was the first staff writer there. And uh, and we had a retreat uh, and I said to the editor, then Bill Keller, the editor of the paper, I said, you know, if in five years we won't, we won't have circuits anymore because technology will be so embedded in so many different places that we won't need a separate section mm-hmm. um, on technology. The funny story about Google is, mm-hmm. that, so that was my little bit of being a visionary. But actually, I have no vision because when a friend of mine called me in 1998 and he said, I'm investing in this new search engine. Mm -hmm. uh, And I said, why do we need another search engine? (laughs) Yeah, that was bad. And um, (laughs) so... But it, but it is, you know, you. I do remember the first time I had email, which was really early. Um, and I'm also, I'm, my late husband and I wrote a, a history of the Internet together. And, you know, it, it was amazing how people did not understand back then uh, when the ARPANET, the precursor to the Internet, started. Exa- they just didn't quite see what would happen. It was It's hard to see, mm-hmm. really, what's, yeah. what's going to happen. But, um, but with, with, the, um, with circuits, one of the things we did was we, we, we looked at the intersection of, of society and technology. And so I wrote the first stories about, you know, people breaking up over email, which, you know, it, you know, happens all the time now. And 
uh, for when chick people are chicken and <laughs> and 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 how we're tethered to our devices it felt like a really really new thing i wrote a story about people who couldn't seem to get away from their devices and people sleeping with their phones which who doesn't now right <laughs> so that um it was that was really a fun a fun time to be writing. But the founders that. did not understand the implications of what they were. Oh, doing. The, the of the like internet. Like the Google people or no. the <laughs> the ARPANET people didn't weren't able to spool out. No, no. not you mean the the dark side of what's happening? Yeah, yeah. Sort of all of the implications of how it would change mm -hmm. everything in life. Um. No. I wouldn't think so. And they I, wouldn't, and they will not tell you that they that they did. Yeah, I think giving everyone a voice. Which has ha has happened. Yes, people people are surprised at what people want to express. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's and, and it's actually and it's not why it started. It started as this research mm -hmm. network, so that researchers yeah. could they were doing actual network research into computer networks, and they were all it was also a way for academics to to share information. So, mm. yeah, you, you you mentioned this thing about seeing the world changing. I mean, I I remember walking to the Grand Central train station in New York from 6th Avenue to 5th and everything, and you, total traffic jam. And I, on 6th Avenue, there was a young woman rollerblading, when that was cool, right up the middle of all the traffic, and she was talking on her cell phone while she was doing it. And I thought, wow, one or the other of those is, you know, dangerous enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but both at the same time. And then I went down the street, and at the end of the long traffic jam, there was a couple in the in an SUV, which was a new kind of car, and they were both on their phones. They had just both gotten out of work and were together, but they were both on their phones talking to somebody else while they were in their car leaving. And I thought, okay, we're in a new world. This is mm -hmm. this is going to be a different world. Um, right. So, one question that has come in online. Oh, it's perfect timing. <laughs> so. It, we know you mentioned that you got married in 2009, I think. So. We I'm met in, in 2012. 2012. But well, you met that. Maybe so, is that when it was? I think so. Around that. We met in 2009, correct? Yeah. So first, I'd like to thank Wonderfest for, you know, uh, help sponsoring this program before we get to this, because no one will remember that after we, okay. we get to this question. Thank you. <laughs> um, so one of the online audience members would like to know We'd like to have each of you. I mean, do we have to make them one leave the stage while they tell the story and then the other one come back? They want to know each of your point of view on how you met. Oh. <laughs> you can go first. We have four minutes. Is that yes. all? Well, you can run over time. Go ahead. You go ahead and run over time. It's all right. Okay. So uh, let's see. I uh, was, um, my husband had died. Our, my daughter was eight. I went, my daughter and I were shipwrecked for a long time. And I got a call from a friend um, saying, what are you doing about men? And I said, absolutely nothing. And, and uh, he said, would you have dinner with a friend of mine who's going through a tough divorce? And I said, sure, why not? And so then I met Bob at a restaurant and, um, and he's Bob's very um, funny. And so when I got to the restaurant, uh, the first thing he did was make me laugh, which was really sweet. And uh, then I had no idea how to date. And so I just did this data dump of my life, which has not been like the prettiest thing. And poor Bob was sort of, who had this f sort of mind numbingly boring life as it, but nice. Like, <laughs> <laughs> growing up on Long Island with a family and dogs and Everyone, you know, pretty happy, and um, and he listens to my sordid story, and I could see and him kind was, of. This was the 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 alcoholic mother and the not and, yours, mother. No, no, Katie's, <laughs> and like being taken to her, 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 basically being airlifted out of a situation where she was living with her mother because her mother was found drunk on the ground and this and that. And I grew up in this like very nice suburban thing with lovely parents and sisters and a collie. And, and I'm listening to this and it's like, I need to get the hell out of here. There's no way that she isn't crazy because she's telling me all of the stuff she got through. 
but I kind of recognize that it's also, it was wonderful to hear how honest and open and guileless she was and she was obviously brilliant and, and, uh, and beautiful. And I said, oh. okay, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go on another date. <laughs> And the, but the, one of the problems was the Kafka thing, yeah. Because I, <laughs> you know, she was clearly she was operating on a very high intellectual plane, mm-hmm. and you know, my favorite movie was Animal House, and there is you know, <laughs> is is Animal, is Animal House, <laughs> nothing nothing to to supplant that. So you know that created a little bit of. Did you read uh, the book Animal House too? No. no. Oh, bug. that that. Oh yes. <laughs> With a bug. farm. I don't <laughs> so, you know, it, after a few dates, we realized there was something there, and uh, it's been lovely. That's great. After a couple of days, that's a pretty quick uh, yeah. covering of the divide there. Yeah. Yeah. Right, honey? Is that how it went? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Did your daughter approve? Oh, dear. Yeah, that's a whole other we only yeah, she, <laughs> the, the amazing so I have two sons neither of whom were even the slightest interested in medicine uh-huh. uh, one ended up in, uh, in do, doing baseball analytics doing money ball uh-huh. uh, the other works in an escape room here in San Francisco and Katie's daughter wanted to be a doctor from the time she was five mm-hmm. and so we met when she was 15 and uh the first time we met is actually in Katie's memoir. It was hilarious. It was uh, she came into a restaurant screaming at Katie because Katie had basically blown her off. And, <laughs> and I kind of saved the day there. But what was then quite lovely was that she would go on rounds with me in the hospital. And mm. and uh, and I would tell one quick final story was was she saved my career. And the way she saved my career was one time when she was in college. She was home over Christmas and I was attending on the wards at UCSF and and uh, I said, Zoe, do you want to come on rounds with me? She said, sure. So I, she came on rounds and rounds are there's the attending, the senior doctor, resident, interns, medical students. There's like 10 people and you go in to see this patient. So we went to see this patient and the patient was sitting in a chair by the bedside. And I said to the patient, do you mind if I sit on your bed to talk just so we were at eye level? And I sat in his, on his bed between the bed rail and the, the, the foot of the bed and his bed rail. And I sat down and then I got up to listen to his lungs and I got up to listen to his heart. And finally I said, thank you very much. And we all left the room and my entire team filed out of the room. They were in the hallway and I was about to step into the hallway and Zoe tapped on my shoulder and she said, Bob, you might want to stop. And I said, why? She said, take a look at your white coat. So we wear this white coat that's got a big thick belt around it. Mm -hmm. And the final time that I had gotten up, this patient's half-filled urinal, which had been on his bed rail, <laughs> hooked on to the back of my white coat. So I was about to step into the hallway wearing a half-filled urinal <laughs> on my coat that people would have just said, wow, he's so efficient, he carries around, around his own <laughs> urinal. So since that moment, I've been grateful that she saved, <laughs> saved my career. So it's been, she's wonderful she's actually a resident in my program now uh-huh. she went to medical school and she's a resident of program in my program her fiance is also a resident in, in my program so it's really been been very very special i can't think of a better way to finish this that that's a great story yeah wow <laughs> um is she gonna keep eye on you as you you know move on here so you can <laughs> <laughs> she, she has my back I hey, all good she has your back is that for sure yeah exactly well thank you very much uh katie and bob for uh, joining us it. here at the commonwealth club tonight i know you've done a lot of things for the commonwealth club before we wanted to to have you together it was it was a great idea thank, thank you. you very much it's been a joy thank you thank you, thank you. Thanks, honey. Thank you. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club uh, in its 121st year of enlightened discussion. And we want to thank Wonderfest again for supporting this program. Thank you all for coming. And we'll see you again here another time. Thanks.